Today I'm going to be talking about building my repeater. This is part two. If you missed part one, you can watch it up there. It was me basically just hoping and dreaming of how it would end up being when it was done. Then I actually started thinking about it and it's all different now. So in this video, I'm going to go over some of the changes I've made. What I thought I was going to be doing is now much different from what I am actually going to be doing. The repeater's not done yet. I'll probably start hooking everything up tomorrow. So if you came just to see me plug it in and turn it on and talk on it, you can go away now. But if you want to stick around and listen to how and why I got from where I was to where I am now, and hang around and you'll learn a few things. First of all, I want to go over a couple of items. A lot of people have been asking how they can support the channel a lot. A disturbingly lot of people. I turned them all away, told them to keep their money, but I did go ahead and set up channel memberships. So for only $1.99 per month, you can support the channel. There's a link to it right there. You can cancel anytime. So if you only want to support $1.99 worth, do it for one month and then cancel. If you can't afford $1.99, I'm not going to make fun of you. It was once a time in my life when I couldn't afford $1.99, so I'll give you a pass. Instead, you can just do whatever makes you feel good about yourself. Since the part one video, I've had to do a lot more planning and figuring out how I'm going to do things, and I had to watch a lot of YouTube channels. And I learned a couple of very important things by watching other people's videos about building repeaters. The most important thing I learned about watching those other videos is that those guys are boring as Oh my God. And they overcomplicate everything. I just want to build a repeater that works and works well. Doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to have the zero oscillation harmonics on the oscilloscope. If I'm ever that boring on a video, just unsubscribe. Put me out of my misery. So the first thing that I learned is with my power supply, I learned that when you order a power supply or anything really, always order it for the type of power and electricity that they use in your country. The first power supply that I ordered, uh, I ordered it for 220 volts. Where I live, we normally have in the normal outlets, 120 volts. So I had to send that one back and I got the uh, got this one, the Samalex 12 volt power supply. It's similar to the one that I had before. The other one was uh, back ordered. That's another thing. I got this newer power supply because the other one was back ordered. I had to wait quite a while for my duplexer because it was back ordered. It, the antenna was back ordered. A lot of things were back ordered and a lot of people leave comments about radios mostly when I do radio reviews and uh, they'll go and they'll complain to me that it's out of stock. It's not available. Yeah, this stuff is popular. GMRS is popular. A lot of people want it just like you want it. And sometimes the demand outweighs the supply. And when that happens, that means you have to wait or find somewhere else to buy it. Don't complain to me. Remember back when you couldn't get toilet paper? It's like that. Now, the next thing that I had to figure out was what channel I was going to use for the repeater. In GMRS, the channels are very simple. You've only got eight choices of channels to use for your repeater. Channels 23 through 30. So the way that I figured out what channel to use was, oh, a lot of people left comments, again, thank you for the comments and the help, telling me to just use the frequency coordinator in my area and he'll tell me what I can use. In GMRS, there are no frequency coordinations. In GMRS, repeater operators have to work like grown-ups between and amongst themselves to figure out what frequencies to use. So like the good GMRS citizen that I am, I listened, I've been listening, I know the channels and the frequencies in my area that are available. I chose repeater number 17 which uh, on some radios might show up as repeater number 25. It's 462-600. It was the first one available that on my list that I went through that I could use, so I chose that. There's no magic to choosing. I just picked an open repeater. Now, if it turns out that another GMRS repeater operator is using that same frequency, I know in my case, nobody is, but later down the road, if another new guy comes on and puts wants to be a pillar of his community and put his own GMRS repeater up, if he starts using the same frequency that I'm using, then we would have to have a discussion and see who wins and, and work it out. Generally, I would just assume whoever's there first gets it. The other thing I had to decide was, did I want to keep this repeater private or did I want to have it open to the world? I am not an air hog. 
I want my repeater to be open to the world. So it will be open and available to anyone that wants to use it. Now I will be putting a tone on it because as I was thinking about it kind of and figured this out already in my head, but a lot of people left comments, again, thank you for the helpful comments, saying that even if it was open, I should put a tone on it. By putting a tone on it, that will keep people from driving by, from just accidentally keying it up. I chose the tone 141.3. When it comes to choosing which tone, you just, you pull it out of your hat. Doesn't really matter which tone you use. 141.3 is the, the travel tone, so if somebody's looking to connect to a repeater, that would be the logical first one that they would pick. So that's what I picked. I did list it at mygmrs.com. That was actually very easy to do. I already had an account. You just go in and hit the add repeater button. So now anybody going to mygmrs.com, which is pretty much the place you go when you want to find a GMRS repeater, they type in my area, they'll come up and they'll see my repeater. I also put a link from there to my website where I have a dedicated page about the repeater with how it's built and the current status that I'll try to keep up to date as often as possible. You can Check that there. If you live in the local area, keep an eye on that page and then you'll know when I get it up and running. So as all my parts and stuff were coming in, I had everything ordered, but like I said, some things were back ordered. Sometimes we have to wait. Everything started coming in. I kind of started roughing everything in to see how it would go together. But one of the first things I had to purchase was coax. And in my first video, I said it would be stupid to buy the best, most fancy LMR 400 coax when I could just use some RG58X like I use in my Jeep instead. A lot of people left comments and suggestions. Again, thank you very much for the help, saying that that would not be a good idea. So of course I ignored them and went and did my own research. They were right. In the CB world where I come from, coax doesn't make that much of a difference, especially if you're in a vehicle where it's only gonna be, the length is only gonna be 15 or 20 feet long. But in the GMRS world, which is UHF, those frequencies, are high. The CB world 27 megahertz is way down here. GMRS is 462, 467 megahertz. In those higher frequencies, the coax cable that you use really does make a difference. I watched a few videos of people doing tests and actually gathering data instead of just talking. And when you're using cheap coax, you can lose like 40 and 50% of the power. So if I'm outputting 50 watts at the radio, by the time it goes through the duplexer and the, the cable run, I may only be getting 20 or 30 watts out. If even that, it could even go lower based on those recommendations from the viewers. Thank you very much. I got uh, LMR 400 coax. So that is probably the most important part in the whole chain. If you want the most amount of power out of the antenna as possible, you want to get a good high gain antenna, which I did, the Tram 1486, available at buy2wayradios.com. And you want good coax. Now that coax is stiff. It's like trying to feed a broomstick through holes and walls and stuff, but it is good quality. Speaking of the duplexer, the duplexer did come in. Doesn't look like much, just a little box. Antenna goes in here. One of the uh, radios connects here and the other one connects there. That allows me to use one antenna instead of two antennas. Now, if you want to save 150 bucks, you could get two antennas. You got to mount them far apart because having the two antennas together, one, one transmitting while the other's receiving can cause, understandably, issues. So with the duplexer, I can use just one antenna. That's the other thing that I changed. So initially, I wanted to mount my antenna, obviously, in the highest, most central part of the uh, roof so I could get 360 degree coverage out of the antenna. And as you may recall from part one, my problem is I didn't know how I would get up to that antenna to mount it. If anything went wrong with it, I wanted to be able to get up to it. One of my requirements is that I need to be able to put it up myself and I need to be able to get to it to fix it or make changes or do whatever. So what I first wanted to do was mount it at the top of the chimney, two and a half stories up on the roof that's like this. That's So I ended up changing the location just to a corner of the house using a push-up type uh, telescoping mast. Again, another suggestion from the viewers. Thank you very much. I never would have thought of this stuff on my own. So that way I can mount it, get it up there by myself. It's telescoping, telescoping, so I can raise it up if I need to. I'll probably start with it low. I have an issue with that location. I can't put guy wires around it, so I can't go too high. But from my location, I don't really need that 360 degree perfect coverage. I'm already 2,000 feet above sea level, and that's what puts me at about a thousand feet over the rest of the Inland Empire that I'm going to be covering. 
and directly behind me are mountains. So I don't care. Two blocks behind me are the, are the mountains. It's a huge mountain range. I don't need 360 degree coverage. So in my new location, the house will be blocking behind me, but I don't care because right behind that are mountains. So that's fine. That new location also puts the antenna much closer to where the radio will be mounted. So I went from needing 120 feet of coax to only needing about 60 feet of coax. So that's gonna keep my line loss lower. Shorter coax is better. Not often you hear shorter is better, but it is in this case with coax. I'll be mounting the whole shebang the two radios and the power supply and everything in a cabinet that I have already in the garage. Now, some of you may be saying it's going to get too hot in the garage. I'm in Southern California. It gets hot here, but my garage is actually well insulated and the back wall that it will be against right behind it is the crawl space of the house, which is actually underground. We're on a slant. So half of the house is underground. And so I'll be able to put holes in that wall. Actually, there will be holes to get the coax and wires through. I can allow cool, dry air to come in from under the house to help cool it off if necessary. I've already got a remote uh, thermometer so I can keep an eye on the temperature. I could uh, put in a small fan and have it controlled with my uh, Apple HomeKit setup so that when the temperature reached a certain setting, it would automatically turn the fan on. So I may end up having to do that. Now, another issue that several people brought up in the comments on my first video, thank you, was the duty cycle of the Ocean KG-1000 radios that I'll be using. Affiliate links below from buy2wayradios.com. How are these KG-1000Gs gonna last when people are talking on it potentially 24 seven all day long? So I contacted Ocean and they confirmed that these KG-1000Gs will run all day, transmitting all day long without voiding the warranty if you're talking on it 24 seven, as long as it's got a nice cool airflow and it's not allowed to uh, overheat. So according to Ocean, at least, the duty cycle should not be an issue with the KG-1000Gs. Affiliate links below. A little more on the antenna installation. I got the telescoping, telescoping, uh, that'll be mounted up on one of the uh, corners of the house, mounted in the ground. And along with that, I'm gonna need a little bit of this and a little bit of this. Grounding, this is my uh, RF ground spark arrestor and this will be for the uh, grounding. You will find no other subject on the YouTubes with more FUD and BS and misinformation around it than grounding an antenna. So we're not going to have any antenna grounding discussion or details that I'm going to talk about because no matter what I say, some moron is going to post the comment saying it's wrong and my house is going to burn down. And if you don't believe me, Go watch any video about grounding antennas, not just grounding antennas, grounding anything. The stupidity is very thick when it comes to uh, legends of grounding. What I will say is that I did some research, check the uh, National Electric Code, as well as watching some videos from the AARL, American Amateur Radio League of Gentlemen, something, I don't know, ARRL, American Radio League of Gentlemen. I did my research. And when I thought I understood what needed to be done, I talked to my friend, Rich, the electrician, who confirmed what I had planned is right. It's really not that complicated to ground it properly. Uh, you need an RF ground, oh, no details. Do your research. If you're unsure, talk to an electrician. Don't trust anything that anybody says ever in any YouTube comment when it comes to grounding. Think twice before trusting any comments that some random clown posts on any video about anything. But when it comes to grounding, only go to a trusted, known source that really you can trust knows what they're talking about that a american ARRL league of gentlemen amateur whatever have videos about the right way to do it it's not complicated the complicated part is sifting through the bullshit to find what you actually need to do and once you know it's not that hard no comments about grounding this i'm not going to let my channel be a soapbox for stupidity you know that if you watch my videos any comments about grounding will be deleted there will be no grounding discussions here. No grounding comments. One thing I will say is that if you do end up having to pound or drive a new grounding rod, make sure you check with the utilities first. Call them to make sure where you're going to pound it in. You're not going to drive it into a gas line or an electric conduit or anything like that. Because that thing's got to go eight feet down into the ground. You don't know what's under there. So check with the utilities. They can come out. They'll mark and show you where, uh, where everything is so you don't poke a hole in it. Some of the other things I needed to buy, several uh, patch cords. Those are for going from the uh, duplexer to the radio, very low loss. Had to buy some adapters. So the cost is going up. I haven't added it all up. It is still less expensive 
to put it all together yourself using two Ocean KG-1000Gs, affiliate links below. A few people have left comments saying, well, that's stupid. You can do it cheaper, just buy in a whole thing. Yeah, they say that, and yet they don't leave a link to where these inexpensive repeaters are. So maybe they're out there. I couldn't find them. I plan on putting it all together in the next day or two. I've got to program the two radios so that they work together as a repeater, get everything up and plug it in and test it. So that will be the next video, actually configuring it and seeing what happens. So keep an eye out for that, hopefully within the next couple of days. If you have questions, leave them in the comments. If you have comments about grounding or helpful information about grounding, keep it to yourself. It'll get deleted. If you're building your own repeater and you've got uh, more suggestions for me, previous suggestions were very helpful. Probably the most positive, helpful feedback I've ever gotten on a uh, video of mine. So thank you very much. If you've got more suggestions, as long as it's not about grounding, leave it in the comments below. Thank you for watching and we hope to see you on the trip.